Julia Grace, you look beautiful and vibrant, just to match your personality. <laughs> so perfect. <laughs> Thank you. So I know that you're a singer-songwriter, and mm -hmm. I know that you were a teacher, and I know yes. that you're a speaker. Yeah. And uh, that you get to speak full time now, and that you've written a book, so you're soon to be published author. Yeah. Um, so I, I also know that there's heartbreak inside of your story, yeah. and humanity, and all of that stuff that happens to us as we live a life. Yeah. But can I go back to <laughs> our kind of early memories when yes. I remember washing the dishes, and I had three children under four. Wow. And I remember washing the dishes and thinking or saying to, I would say, God, I need a bigger audience than this. <laughs> like the one-year-old, the three-year-old, the uh, four-year-old were just not quite doing mm, it for me no. full time, right? Yeah. So I kind of had this thought and the thought went along the lines of whatever opportunity comes up next, I'm saying yes. Right. Now, I would term that personally as a prayer. Yeah. Uh, but the thing that came up next meant that I got to work with you. World Vision called and they said, we're gonna, yes. we're gonna get, we've got this wonderful idea to increase child sponsorship. Yeah. We're gonna tour and do girls' nights. There's a seven layer chocolate fountain. I said, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. um, they said, Julia Grace is yeah. gonna sing. You can talk. And of course, I love women yes. and I love talking, but I really love encouragement. Yeah. I love the idea that we don't have to do this alone. Yeah. And I didn't have to do Girls' Night Out alone. I got to do it with you. And we toured around New Zealand. We had so much fun. Didn't we? That fountain. I know. You know, honestly, <laughs> it was a long time ago. People are still talking about it. When I go to the Deep South, people yeah. will also reference, years ago you came along and you and Petra did this thing and they remember that was me, it was you, and they mostly remember the chocolate fountain as the third wheel. So, hey. That's pretty I love good. That. That's a pretty good trio. <laughs> yeah. I'm in. I I'm agree. in for the seven layer chocolate fountain. And it was lovely, wasn't it? We'd we'd yeah. eat and we'd drink, we'd chat, and then at the end we'd say, Do you want to sponsor a child? And some people would say, Yes, please. Mm. And uh, I remember feeling so grateful to have that outlet to um, I guess, I don't know, just share stories. Yeah. Because because being alive is challenging at times. Yep. And it's also wonderful. And I got to, it meant that I got to sit and hear you sing a lot. And I got to experience your sense of humour, which is profound and deep. How would you describe <laughs> your sense of humour? <laughs> Inappropriate and dark, ah! actually. <laughs> I got it off my father. Really? Um, and a very, very cheeky man, British father. Mm -hmm. I think I, I need a support group for anyone with British fathers because they're adorable and we love them, but. God, they're so cheeky. If I turn up to his house looking less than well-groomed, he goes, oh, given up the fight, have we? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I got that from. But I love this idea that when I'm talking to an audience, there's a sense of you almost blow up the balloon. You get those beautiful emotional moments. You know, people are crying. And then everything inside me just goes, pop the balloon, pop the balloon, <laughs> say something naughty. <laughs> and when you pop the balloon, they laugh. And the funniest thing is, from a psychology point of view, that's actually when they learn. People learn when they feel. So I didn't know that when I started, and I've discovered that along the way. And uh, much to my delight, I get to still do uh, dark, inappropriate humour and burst the bubble all the time, and people love it. So who are you talking to a lot these days? So many different people, actually. Mm -hmm. Incredible openings. So I've been able to speak to a bunch of schools and education spaces, mm -hmm. all the way through from tertiary right down to primary often to the parents, to the teachers, the staff, but also to the kids. And this year I did the Nationwide Young Leaders Days and I spoke to around about nine and a half thousand young people aged around 19, 11, 12, 13. Did you have to keep the inappropriate humour under bed? I under had hat? to make sure it was appropriate. I had to take Charlie the Chicken to, you know, um, make things funny. But talking to them about anxiety was amazing and talking to hear, seeing these kids come out of that situation buzzing and talking about their wobbly point and finding themselves a jelly buddy and, and starting to get messages back now from parents where the children have gone home all over New Zealand and talk to their parents about how to deal with anxiety and it filters back through. So all the way through from there I'm speaking in a corporate space, speaking into um, government departments and actually sharing better easier to use mental health language but as part of that my own journey is a real big part of it too. I noticed that you have allowed the sparkles to come through. You're a silver-haired wahine now. Yeah. 
C- c- what happened and how is that for you? Because it's very obvious to me that you haven't given up. Yeah, well, part of it was financial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. It was actually a really mixed kind of thing. I always, so I'd been blonde all my life. And then when I, the day before I released my first album, I dyed my hair dark and it was done in a kind of a group consensus and it was it was done with my permission so I'm not complaining but I remember sitting around the table with uh, a group from a record label and the photographer and I remember the photographer leaned over and touched my hair and said to everybody else in the group I wonder what she'd look like with dark hair and I was like oh okay this is this is new and just kind of went with it and I, I had a wonderful sponsorship and, the, and I got this beautiful dark hair with a big red streak in it, remember those days. And so for the next period of time I had dark hair in a variety of iterations and part of that was the fact that other people were influencing who I was and how I looked. And I, I did actually enjoy being part of that process. But coming out of that period of time I found myself single and I found myself making my own decisions and after a few years I kind of was like maybe I'd like to revisit Blonde Julia and so I let my hair kind of grow out over a summer and it started to get lighter and lighter and then I got it lightened and then I discovered how expensive it was to maintain blonde lightened hair and then my hairdresser went on maternity leave and so I just stopped dyeing my hair. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's funny how things happen so isn't it was it? just this little process yeah and so after about f- three or four years yeah I sort of stopped and thought wow I really do feel like me I actually feel more like myself yeah with my hair light with it it's it's white but comes out blondy mm-hmm. and actually quite a freeing thing of going I'm not going to color it ever again so I'm kind of like, I don't have to actually think about that anymore. It's quite lovely, eh? And I just like embracing that. Yeah. Um, thanks to my mum. It started here, the white. Just And side. just kind of slowly made its way to the back. And it's a bit of a rainbow. I love it. So the the tui that you won, that's what, in the cupboard now? Close the door? <laughs> no, that sits behind me when, I'm on, oh, when I'm on Zoom calls. <laughs> I make sure that thing oh, is shining really? out oh, of nice, my nice. hair. Yeah. Uh, yes, that that does. It's actually that one's actually made of gold. Um, they stopped making them out of gold, so I'm one of the last actual gold ones. It's really heavy. Could use to open a bottle. Could potentially, you know, kill a robber. It's heavy, um, but a very proud moment. And recently, I actually put up all my awards and my certificates in my office cool. to remind myself of the fact that I've done a whole bunch of things, but there's still heaps of things that I'd love to do. What I hear when you say that is you're not one Julia. Yeah. You're not a single layer Julia, mm. not just Julia the musician. But Julia the musician <laughs> Julia the musician and singer songwriter and a award winning artist gets to come along the journey with Julia the speaker. Yes. Yeah. So you get to take all of you into the next iteration or season of you. Yes, and iteration I often I love that word. Mm. So then can we talk a bit about your story? Because I know you've been on a on a big journey. I mean, you and I were doing that tour and I was sort of having a, you know, every now and then I'd have an, a night off from being mum yeah. and you'd have a night off from your real life yeah. as well and we'd have this amazing time. But your journey went, went on from there and, and, and heartbreak is involved. And mm. I guess, um, yeah, I'm interested in how, you, how you've unpacked mm. your mental health journey. Yeah. I, what were the signs that you needed to pay more attention to your own mental health? Yeah. Because we've all got mental health. We do, we do. I love people talk about science who's got mental health. I'm like, well, they if they have a brain in their head and breath in their lungs, we do have mental health. <laughs> Let's talk about how robust it is or how well it is rather than whether we've got it or not. Interestingly, that period of time, sometimes our mental health challenges get masked by other things. And I think often, you know, when we are perhaps more robust and energetic, mental health challenges can get masked by just pretending everything's okay. We are, you know, perhaps we're younger or more resilient, we're full of energy or something is making us feel externally strong. And so often we don't take the time to slow Mm. down and and stop and listen and conversely at the other end of the spectrum when things are challenging sometimes mental health 
challenges can be masked as grief, as heartbreak, as loneliness, and uh, we tend to perhaps think, oh, she'll be fine, she's just a bit heartbroken, or she's just a bit sad, and figuring that out can be challenging. So that's interesting that you say that. We'll dig into that. Mm. I'm thinking about the fact that I know as an 18-year-old I suffered from this season Mm -hmm. where I was like, I don't know if I'm so tired I'm sad or so sad I'm tired. Like there was some confusion there, but I identified it eventually as depression Mm -hmm. and I didn't really deal with it. It dissipated. Mm. Talked about it in another podcast episode. (laughs) It just sort of went. But when I gave birth to Venetia, it came back as postpartum Yes. adjustment yeah and that is another way of saying probably mild postnatal depression mm-hmm. and we figured that out because I was crying a lot and not talking much mm. and I do talk a lot and laugh a lot mm. so I think when I hear you say things can be disguised as other things mm. it's I've seen it as the the changing situation the the new new orientation towards my life that I was now fully responsible for this child that my life had changed irrevocably (laughs) yeah um put enough pressure in a different place for the for what was there underneath and needed dealing with which was an overdeveloped sense of responsibility a sense of perfectionism maybe Mm. a couple of other coping mechanisms that I'd used and employed in my life to keep my life going let's keep going yeah now those mechanisms didn't work they what I call expired yeah, great way to yeah. talk about that. And so then I started doing some work. I went to counselling and yes. started paying attention to my mental health. Yes. So for you, what happened? What, what's your story? Yeah. Well, similar in that, that those things are under the surface. So we all have our tendencies towards our coping mechanisms. Yeah. And interestingly, in, in my book, I went through and I looked back at how did I get here? How did I get to my midlife and find myself in a situation where I was dealing with quite a major episode and and variety of different things of a diagnosis of depression and anxiety. And of course, these things don't happen suddenly. No, they don't really. And And so they they often, if we go back, we can sort of go, oh, in retrospect, look, everything's easy to see, is that we all have 20-20 hindsight. Yeah, but maybe it's also helpful to look back and go, oh, I can make sense to myself. Yes. Because we can turn back with compassion, can't Mm. we? We can look back and see the patterns yeah. and see yeah. perhaps some of the reasoning behind and then also go, what am I going to do? What, what am I going to do with what I've got here? How much time am I going to give this? And, you know, what, what what's in my hand to do and what's out of my control? And so for me, looking back and seeing, um, you know, the little Julia, which was always... The, the entertainer, the person who loved to make everybody laugh, liked having everybody like me. I guess, I wouldn't say hardwired, but grown up to believe that you do as you're told, particularly from strong, um, <laughs> strong, <laughs> yeah, strong people who have got loud voices and yeah. big bodies and, and strong authority roles are scary and you do what they're, they're told. It's a generational thing too. It's less so this, this younger generations, less yeah. like that. So when you're trained in that, um, and then also kind of going, well, I, I want to be able to be this this creative force for good, but I'm not feeling like my normal self as well. So what I mean by the masking is that sometimes something will happen. So for me, for an example, my marriage ended really, really abruptly when I was 40. And so dealing with heartbreak was absolutely made perfect sense. You know, it would have been bizarre for anything else to be happening. Dealing with feeling overwhelmed and feeling knocked flat and dealing with, um, you know, heightened emotions or very blunted emotions so <laughs> on numb. an hour by yeah. hour basis was to be expected for someone in that circumstance. What I did find was over the next couple of years, living in that level of high and low started to burn me out. So what I found was while the initial shock felt like the worst thing to happen in the world, and to be honest, in my world, it was pretty up there of one of the things that could happen to me. And I lived in a very heightened sense of adrenaline, a lot of cortisol running through my body. Um, I <laughs> I lost a whole stack of weight. I, I didn't eat. I didn't sleep. Um, and I found myself very high and very low. But over the next couple of years, as time goes by, when those things don't come to an end, 
or start to work their way out, then we start to see there is a problem. If this cannot go on like this moving forward. I'd never dated. I'd never, um, I married my childhood sweetheart. I'd never kind of done that world. And so when I found myself at 40, um, you know, single, actually going like, what? What do I do? What the heck? I'll tell you the first thing I did, I've probably never told anyone this. First thing as it is, I jumped on a, on a dating website, not to see what kind of men were out there, but to see what 40-year-old women looked like. <laughs> and so I could flick through and go, oh yeah, I can take her. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Have not given yeah, up the yeah, fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, nah, not, not looking too bad. Oh my gosh. But yeah, that almost regressive um, back into who am I? What's going on? Um, and, and like you said, that makes perfect sense. And if that's happening for a period of time, great after a couple of years with some subsequent heartbreaks that start to feel like a pattern I was starting to feel less high and low and more just beige Mm. and which beige was a big sign for anybody who's watching this on Instagram (laughs) or our YouTube channel beige is not Julia as you can see you are wearing like put them up come on come pull them up they're in probably (laughs) whose camera whose camera 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 three um anyway with pink patent boots and I know that you always wore heels on stage I remember and you're not afraid of leopard skin before it was in fashion that's it don't know if that says good or bad things about you good all good uh, (laughs) so good so here you are and I think it's so interesting, isn't it? This mm. idea that, say, you experienced heartbreak and loss at 40 mm. with the loss of your marriage and your husband and that you would revert back to how old were you when you got together? Initially, like, teenagers. We'd known each other our, our whole life. But, yeah, I guess then 19, you've got, 20. You've got yeah. this kind of – it's almost like you could approach your dating with a 19-year-old perspective because yes. that was the last time you were doing it. That's right. And I did. I, did. I approached it with a naivety mm-hmm. of a 19-year-old perspective who'd never been on a date in their life. Um, How and did that you've go got, for you? uh, Yeah, mixed results. Yeah. Mixed results. Any stories you want to share? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was one guy who turned up in a beat-up old car who was trying to convince me that his other car was a Lamborghini. Ah! And uh, and the reason that his ex-wife had had him, um, I think, arrested or, or mm. was was all her fault because apparently everyone's ex is a narcissist <laughs> or a psycho. Yeah, of course, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I was like, mm, yeah, okay. So not Some too interesting naive. stories. Not okay. quite naive enough. I stayed for the good story. So here you are. You're forty and you're dating again. Because you want to be with somebody, because yeah. you have to be with somebody, because you what? I, I actually love being in relationship. And I enjoyed, the, you know, there were some great things, there's some great things about being single. And I did I did actually love that. I love the period of time I look back now and I don't regret anything as far as having a wonderful adventure. But I actually, I love having one person. Even with friendships, I like... Um, I like one-on-one time or small groups and I actually like having quite intense loyal relationships and that's just I guess that's just part of who I am so for me having somebody who I can say look I chose you you chose me let's make a great life together was something that I felt had been taken away from me I hadn't chosen for that to, to not be the case so I kind of was like well that's what I wanted so I would like that again. And I wanted I want to talk about the fact that you were dating again yeah. and you fell in love. I did. And uh, I, I fell in love with not only a, a man, but a, I guess the idea of things working out for better. And I was not not in a malicious way, but was probably sold the idea that a subsequent relationship was a little bit like um, this is why that all happened, so that we could be together. This was sort of the plan of God. This was the big story. And part of me, when you're bobbing about in the ocean of heartbreak, is looking to grab onto some absolutes. Looking to grab the idea that there might be, you know, anyone says everything happens for a reason. That is an intoxicating life belt to grab hold of. Like and, life raft. Yeah, like, and like to kind of like wrap frozen. it around you and go, this is the thing that's going to hold me up whereas I know yeah. that there's another move now which is everything <laughs> happens for a reason and other lies I've loved yes. you know thanks Kate Bowler yeah so yes I can see the appeal of it, things are going to work out so much better than before yes so you're in love with a man who's yeah. what promising you 
the, the world. world. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely promising me the world. And in a very short but very intense space of time, gave and then retracted that love. And the best example I can give, if I can go back to our World Vision Days, Petra, yes. when we did the 40-hour famine, and you're allowed to have that one barley sugar once an yeah. hour. Once I figured out I wasn't allowed to just eat it by the box for, which was very disappointing. Um, and you you would start that barley sugar at the beginning of the hour, and it was you know delicate on your tongue, and you were like, I'm going to make this last as long as possible. And then someone would come in and say something, and you'd get a fright, and you'd swallow your barley sugar whole. Not only did it leave an uncomfortable feeling, in the throat he had this horrible feeling that something was there and now it's just it's gone, gone. it's just it's gone that horrible <gasps> oh disappointment to me feels like a big ginormous swallowing your barley sugar and I remember being just enjoying the sweetness of this beautiful relationship and then realizing that suddenly it was gone <laughs> yeah and I from that period of time I think that probably when I say plunged me, probably triggered off a period of really going very quickly back down into those emotions because it wasn't that long since I had resurfaced. It wasn't that long since my mental health had probably got a bit stronger and a bit more robust and was feeling better. And so a quick heartbreak was a very quick dive down. So had you, can I ask, had you started mm. to take some positive action or do the work, as yeah. some people would call it, after the first heartbreak? No. Okay. Yeah. No, I was so busy just recovering. Surviving, so I, paying yeah, the bills, yep, looking after the kids, yep. managing the broken relationship probably. You yeah. Know, there's childcare swaps, aren't there? There's lots of yeah. complex things. It was, it was a huge period of time of just dealing, just putting out fires and actually going, I did not have the time, the space, the mental capacity to dig deep because I actually felt like I was a bit of a walking skeleton myself at the time emotionally probably physically as well I was really sort of ex I was really overextended so the capacity for someone like that if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs when I did not feel safe emotionally or even physically or you know my home was under threat and all those things chances of me going into dealing with self-actualization and doing the mahi just Absolutely, yeah. I, it was just literally get through the day, pay the bills, you know, don't try not to cry in front of too many people. I was just an absolute hot mess. And I'm so grateful to all those who allowed me to just come and <laughs> tell my story over and over and over and over again. Friends are good. Who listened. Oh, girlfriends. Oh, my gosh. Girl gang. Just being there and allowing me to say the same complaint. <laughs> over and over and over and go oh yeah <laughs> mm, for it's, you. Oh, it's important incredible it's important to yeah. get it outside of ourselves so I didn't have the capacity to do any more work than that and I guess the subsequent heartbreak there was enough time and space and actually I began to get messages coming to me to say hey you are not yourself and it ain't getting any better I like the fact that you're not berating yourself for the fact that you didn't and couldn't do the work at that initial heartbreak. And my whole, my, my book is called, my, my whole motto, my tagline is that, be kind to your mind. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, even when you say, when you've said to me, I think no one's ever asked me that question, you know, were you doing the work? And there's a part of me that wants to go, well, yes, of course I, 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 was. Yes, I was. Well, I did this and that. And then I, I'll be honest, I, no, absolute zero. Um, I did what I could do to survive. I had a little bit of a whatever it takes, whatever it takes, just get it done. And yeah, that sometimes we do feel the pressure to rewrite history and go back and appear wiser or smarter than we were. But actually going, you, I worked at the t I worked with the information I had on the day and the last 10 years have taught me a lot of things that I could have applied at the time, but I didn't have I didn't have those tools, which is why I'm so absolutely hot on giving people better language, because I didn't know how to express that I wasn't great, you know, how to talk about the wobbly day, how to use those sort of language in terms that weren't so scary. It was very much you're either sick or well, it was all on or all off, it was you're all too hard. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start, let's dig mm. into some of that, because I'm, I'm keen to hear some of your language. Yeah. The second heartbreak yeah. happened 
like the breakdown of a of an old relationship carries a lot of loss, right? Yeah. The loss of history, yeah. the loss of whānau, extended whānau, yes. the loss of traditions. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I know. No, no. <laughs> the division of property. Yeah. So much. The loss of a new relationship has a different texture. Yeah. So, so even the loss of something old, you're also not in that honeymoon phase. You're not in that, mm. the sun shines out of that person's eyes and every other <laughs> orifice. It's like, you're not, you know, it's not, yeah. it's not just like all the possibility and all the potential. You're also like, oh, well, that was annoying about yeah, them. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, at least I won't have to deal with Uncle XYZ. Yes, you know, yeah. like, but the loss of a, like this falling in love, like yeah. falling heavily for the fantasy and this yeah. promise of a new future. Yeah. Like you, it sounds like that ended in the honeymoon period when nothing had gone wrong yet. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah, so we, we know from psychology that we have these honeymoon periods called the limerence. Uh-huh. And understanding that when we have uh, a new relationship or a new car or a new phone or a new anything, we will have a period of time in which our brain is literally only giving us all the nice information. It's exciting, it's fun, the, the gloss is not worn off. Like you say, we haven't realised that if you flip that thing over the back of it, it doesn't look quite as good as the front. And so when we lose something in that early stage, we haven't even had the chance to kind of get a little bit irritated or, or, or see that. And so we're almost losing a dream. Mm. even more than a reality and yeah I think understanding that when even though it looks like you're losing something short Mm -hmm. you're losing something glossy and something that's yeah just very very hard to take and also when you've had something taken from you then having it taken from you again you're starting to feel like am I ever going to have control Am I ever going to be the person that gets to make the call? And I know it's hard to be on the other side of the coin. I have now been in subsequent situations where I've had to make the decision to decide that a relationship is is not for me. And that's not easy either. Um, You know, there's there's two sides to that. It can be painful to have to say, I I don't want to be in this relationship. But when when that control is taken out of your hands, you feel so powerless. And I think a feeling of powerless brings a feeling of lowering of who I am and where I stand, my agency, and, you know, who am I? And and it can just make us feel really disheveled and, yeah, our place is lost. And you could end up in a tailspin, can't you? Like, what's yeah. wrong with me? Why do, why do I, why can't I, can't I do relationships? Yes. Can I, like, yeah. it would be easy, I would see, for me to crucialise or catastrophise potentially with thinking. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 100%. So you, <laughs> the dream died. Yeah. And that fellow just walked out of the country yeah. and left yeah. you. Literally. And that actually tipped something in yes. you, didn't it? Like yeah. that actually was a situation that we were talking probably a bit more complex grief or complex yeah. mental health. So what happened? You said you started to get information from people. Mm. Because still you you haven't gone on this journey of going, this is more than heartbreak. Yeah. At that stage, because I was having these other highs and, and, and you know things were looking up, people were sort of like, oh, thank goodness she's okay. You know, and people sort of, I guess, feeling a little bit like, because I've been the person with the problem for years and, and I don't like that and I want to be well and I want to be happy. And during that period of time, I started to get information from other sources. And three people sort of spoke into my world around that time. So the first was my beautiful daughter, Bella. And I remember over a Christmas period, her saying to me, she goes, Mum, it's like you're not even here. And... I, at the time, reacted probably badly to that because I did, you know, what all, as all mothers do, I gave her the speech. If you had any idea the pressure I was under, (laughs) you know, and all that, I'm trying my best. Mm -hmm. And I remember stepping out of that and actually going, oh my gosh, she knows you. She actually knows you so well. What she's recognising is that there's a part of Julia that is just not showing up no matter how hard I try. And she loves you. And it wasn't actually judgmental, it was incredibly insightful, but I just didn't want to hear it. So I'm grateful for her. Mm. Um, The second one was actually my very rude friend, and he has a whole chapter in my book, (laughs) my very rude friend and why he's awesome. And he's British like my dad, and he's dealt with his own mental health journey. Mm -hmm. And we sat down, and instead of having the great Kiwi chat where we all go, hi, how are you, good, how are you, good, I'm fine, fine, fine. He looked me in the eye across the table and said, you don't look well, you need to go to the doctor. 
and I was so confronted. I just wanted to, you know, slap him around. And <laughs> but I remember thinking, I thought I was faking it well. So you thought you had everyone fooled. I turned up to that coffee. I had my great outfit on. I was wearing my bright colours. I was faking it. And he looked way past that and said, no, nah, something's wrong. And then the third uh, probably trigger moment was I went to see my accountant. And uh, she's probably seen me once a year for about 15 years. And I walked in, she goes, oh, you're not your normal self. And I thought, now if my accountant, and with the greatest of respect, accountants not generally known for their, you know, maybe huge level of emotional ups and downs they're there to do the money calm and confident and kind <laughs> yes. and it's secure and it's stable she's noticing like that that something's wrong I was like actually I need to start listening because <laughs> not only are my family noticing not only are my friends noticing now people who don't even see me very often are literally looking at me and going something's wrong so you heard these three wise voices <laughs> yeah. that of course as a human you resisted mostly yes. i understand this justified defend <laughs> yes. what i'm no. fine i'm strong <laughs> i'm really i've got it covered yeah what did you do i went to the doctor Good yeah I, I literally did what what i suggest as a first port of call and it was hard because i had come from a culture from a faith tradition from a family tradition where often these things had been put into spiritual terminology. So mental health wasn't really talked about. I mean, we're talking 11 years ago since that initial start. We're talking about nine years ago since this period of time. We've made a lot of progress in that time. So even walking into a medical situation and going, what could be emotional, could be mental, could be spiritual, maybe it's medical. That was actually quite a hurdle to get over. And I sat down and the doctor said, what's wrong? And I just burst into tears. And he was such a beautiful voice in that moment because I remember him, he, he asked me all these great questions, which is fantastic. And he also said to me, look, if you'd come in here for high blood pressure, there'd be no stigma or embarrassment. If you came in here and you were dealing with diabetes or, you know, there would be no stigma and embarrassment. You're dealing with depression, dealing with anxiety, zero stigma, zero embarrassment, and zero judgment for taking medication around that. And that was such a life-giving voice, and it's one that I have really tried to make sure I amplify in my work. So I take fluoxetine, I yeah. take that, um, it's a fairly low dose, but I take that every day. And I have found that, I'll often say, you know, antidepressants are not a silver bullet, so they mm. don't fix everything mm. necessarily. But what they can do is give you, like you said, the space to go back to the top of the list and work your way through again. Somebody who is already mentally really low or in a really high anxiety spike, saying to them, hey, here's a list of self-care activities. It's just really out of our reach. So giving some good medication that actually helps us to step back in there and actually go through some of those things. Because we can get our antidepressants from a lot of different places, but sometimes we really do need a boost. So, every, I mean, there's, there's a million different opinions on this stuff, but I say be pragmatic. If you need to go to the doctor, go. And if you need to take a medication, take it. And if you need to take it for the rest of your life, well, sue me. I'm just, I will. And I don't just take it for me. I take it for my family. I take it so that my road to wellness was much faster. Mm -hmm. And I've met people who took a six-year or five-year journey to get back to perhaps good relationship. I wasn't prepared to wait that long. Mm -hmm. My life is, you know, I've got short periods of time with my children and my family. I want to make the best of everything that's in front of me and I'm happy to do the work but I'm also happy to use some of the things that will help to get me there. Well I'm really happy to hear your perspective on it because mm. it would be possible I think to be for me to be like verging on toxic positivity like we'll get there and we'll get off the meds mm. but some for some people that's like let's not mm. be trying to set ourselves up to fail like yeah. if you need to stay on the meds, stay yeah. on the meds. Absolutely. I mean, my father's on medication. He'll be on medication till he dies. Yes. And that's the meds that he needs, yeah. his body and brain need at this moment. A little bit of a, a picture I sometimes think of is, 
if you, you know, say you broke an arm and you might need a cast, mm-hmm. so you might need an external support for a period of time. You don't leave the cast on forever. It might be there for a period of time and then we decide the bone is healed enough to take off. Sometimes when people have an accident, we put in a pin or a plate. You don't go in later and dig it out. Mostly not. <laughs> it, 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 you know, it, it, Stays it will there. generally become part mm. of who you are. We've, we're grateful for the fact that our medical professionals have invented some other ways of dealing it. So deciding for yourself with the support of others is is the medication I'm taking, is it going to be a cast? Is it going to be a pin? Um, is it going to be a plate? Does it matter? Like, who cares? Yeah. I, and actually yeah. going, those who are giving opinions to people who are already vulnerable, that they should be somehow taking themselves off the medication that's keeping them well, mm is a heavy responsibility. And I would say, unless you're prepared to be on call 24 seven, you know, and until the end of time for that person, I would stay out of that conversation. And I think that we need to be pragmatic about these things. Mm. If you need to take something, take it. I will unapologetically and unashamedly take it. And if I need to take it for the rest of my life, I will. And if I don't, I won't. And that's for me to decide. Nice. So what else is in your kitty? What mm. else? What other tools? Because you've written a whole book and I it's do. not just see the GP. <laughs> it's not, no. So that was step one. Yeah. yeah. And, and and it was a, a huge step to then help with the others. So I've got a bunch of things that I go through. I have a, a little saying called one degree of change where we're looking at the little small steps that we can take towards, um, you know, well-being at any given time. And we go round and round and round on these things. So to think about the applicability of it Mm. what you had was diagnosed depression and anxiety yes yep but the things you're talking about in your book Mm -hmm. are applicable to somebody who might be in a season of stress or might be like who would you say they apply to everybody actually everyone so one of my overarching concepts is that mental wellness issues are reasonable universal and manageable so reasonable they make perfect sense when you put the body under pressure it reacts. Universal, we are all on a wellness spectrum. So this is not about just those who are in a diagnosed state. This is everybody. We're all under pressure, right? Oh my goodness. (laughs) And so we can all have positive self-care and looking after ourselves. And then manageable, there are heaps of tools in the toolbox. So all of my tools start with a F, um, because it helps me remember. (laughs) I was going to call it Julia Grace and the F words, but I've been told that's not appropriate. So it's not called that. But um, my faith, fullness, fitness, food, fun, pharmaceuticals. See what I did I there? I like AE, it. Fano, uh, forward focus, thankfulness. Thankfulness. <laughs> I'm, I'm really, so really pushing the envelope here. Um, and recently been doing some work around falling asleep, better sleep habits, faffing around. The joys of boredom, how that helps your brain. So all of these things, they are actually tools that we can use to to dig deep and to actually just live really well, mm-hmm. to be honest. Um, is there one that you, one that's not used much or talked about much that you'd like to explore here? One I of your Fs? The f- forward focus okay. is actually having something for yourself to look forward to and understanding that often we, you know, we do all the things that we, we have to do and we need to do because they come right up in our face you know we when things are being demanded of us we will tend to get busy doing those things and we often don't make the space for the things that we literally want to do so finding ways to get clever and connect them together so actually finding some ways of actually putting some of these things so for example if you're saying we're talking about fitness and then making it fun and then having something to look forward to. So some people are like, well, hey, I'm, I'm not interested in doing a fitness regime, but I love to dance. So Friday nights, my, <laughs> you know, my night out or, or they're off to Zumba class or something, but they're combining some of the joys in different ways and getting creative rather than going, so I do this for my fitness, I do this for my fullness, I do this for my faith, putting those things together and actually finding ways to get around it and getting them in the diary. And prioritizing ourselves is important. So, and I've heard you talk about, I guess, some of the limitations that being part of a faith community hmm. um, contributed. For example, maybe being less um, accepting, maybe of of taking medis- hmm. medicine. 
How has your faith supported your journey? Like, yeah. is it still, is it an addition or is it a liability? <laughs> yeah, great question. And it's still very much a part. And in saying that, so around the medication, I've seen huge changes mm-hmm. in the way um, our faith communities have approached mental health over the last 10 years as well. Although in saying that, the first person I heard talk in church about mental health was actually me. Ah. Uh, I was just in the middle of it and just I thought, let's, let's just start talking about whatever's happening. So I'm glad we're making progress in that way. Faith for me has actually been one of my anchors in that whole journey. And I actually talk about my faith as becoming skinnier and deeper. So I'm so less interested in the way things are done. I'm so less interested in judging others and dictating to others and actually much more interested in a strong, deep understanding that I don't have all the answers and I'm deeply suspicious of anyone who says they do. (laughs) But I do hold on to my faith in the picture of the chain going down to the anchor at the bottom of the ocean. And so for me, Wairua Tapu, Holy Spirit being an anchor that holds me into a rock and just those senses of grounding, of beautiful faith practice, of coming together with my, my church and faith community. And I often speak on faith and say it could be as complex as your faith practice. It could be as simple as taking your shoes off and walking on the sand and understanding that we are part of something far bigger bigger than we are. Far bigger, far richer, far deeper. Um, And and taking that time, yeah. Yeah. Taking time to pray, taking time to um, feed your mind with beautiful music, beautiful songs, beautiful melodies. And for me, those are often old, old songs and hymns and things that bring back memories of times when um, life has felt cohesive and when life feels fractured it's beautiful to go back to those spaces so I'm really grateful for the traditions that have been put into my life but I've also learned to revisit uh, some of the harsh edges of those yeah and also to keep you you have critical thought you you have thought that is does this resonate? Does yes. this make sense? Does this is this yeah. life giving? Is this love filled? Yeah. I hear what you're saying. I think we are allowed to question, yeah. um, and that that's a very robust position with almost any ideology or values, and, and also with our faith system. Because you don't, it's not some static set of rules that you just no. you blindly follow. No, dear God, and I don't, I don't do magical thinking, um, and the things that don't, you know. That I'm, I'm allowed to ask those questions. I don't think this is a magic trick. I don't think there's any magic words. I don't think there's any magic way to, you know, if you do this, this, and this, and then that's going to happen Life automatically. Would be perfect. Exactly. Okay. Because what that does is it works for the person who's saying it in the moment, or well, actually probably doesn't, but they're thinking that way. And then for everybody else listening for whom things are not going Great. quite as they thought, we're excluded. When someone stands up in front of any group and says, you know, health, wealth and happiness are the the bastions of of whether it's success or the blessing of God or however you want to put that, and I'm sitting in the audience and I'm thinking I'm not that healthy, certainly not that wealthy, (laughs) and not feeling all that happy at the moment, suddenly I'm out. You're not a success. They are in and Mm. and I'm out. And and so redefining the, the blessing as actually going, you know, the blessing is here. The blessing is that we're here having this conversation. The blessing is the people that are around me. The blessing is my new wonderful husband. Is yes, not that new we, now? Haven't got, <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't talked about it. But, you know, seven, seven years in wow. and um, actually going, where did he come from? Like just this amazing going, life does go on. Life does continue. And it's not going to be the same but it doesn't need to be the same it's got its own you know good things and bad things I'm going to write a pod, uh, a, a blog you know everywhere you go you always take your problems with you so true. <laughs> it doesn't so matter true. what you're doing what you bring to the table walks with you wherever you are there you'll be if you go into a situation and your anxiety is high it doesn't matter how perfect it looks you could still be feeling that sense of high anxiety and something will trigger that so What I'm absolutely hot on is that the person I need to live at peace with the most is actually me. I am my friend. I live in my head. (laughs) It's a crazy place to live, Petra. (laughs) Um, I know, because I contacted you last night. You were supposed to be doing invoices, but you were photoshopping the Sistine ceiling onto... 
a picture your friend was painting you were making up my friend put a photo on Instagram of her painting her wall green and so I, I photoshopped and superimposed her onto the Sistine Chapel because that was much more fun, much more fun than sending in voices. So yeah, my, my, my brain can be a, a crazy place to live in, but I have to live in it. It's your and place. And I have to live in peace. Yeah. And learning to know myself and actually learning to understand yeah, that that faith, all of those things have to come together. Is this is there a is there a nuance here between men and women? Do you think it's different for them? I, I don't know the answer. Do you think women are less likely to be their minds friends and men are more likely to be friends with their minds or, or, or not? I think they have different um, sets of challenges and obviously there'll be people who sit Cross all over. along that yeah, spectrum absolutely. as well. But those who are perhaps in the typical feminine space can can be quite good at sourcing support. So um, looking at telling others, you know, if, if there's one thing that women have been good at, it's getting friends and yeah. actually chatting with their friends. And the classic um, women gathering is, is a really healthy thing when it's done well. Yeah. And I think for perhaps the more masculine end of the spectrum could be challenges around being open or, or finding themselves available to be vulnerable. Uh, but when they do, really it's profound, eh? It is. And, and having permission then to go, we're allowed to go below the surface and kind of get away from the old, just stay stay on the surface. I think as human beings, we, we tend to live on the surface when we feel that going below would expose us in a way that makes us feel unsafe. We're not going to open up our heart to somebody who's going to take advantage of that, whether it's they're going to talk about us or they're going to judge us or they're just going to shut us down and ignore us and we're going to be feeling, you know, really isolated. If that's going to be used as a weapon against us, we're unlikely to open up to it. But sometimes we just perceive it will be when it wouldn't be. So I think what you're saying is very interesting about how when we're not okay, it's so hard to dig down mm. into the not okayness if mm. it's perceived to be this terrible, shameful, embarrassing yes. nightmare of a, it. Everyone else is okay, and yeah, it's only me not. that's struggling. Yeah. Like you know, you hear those things, don't you? If yeah. everybody put their problems and I gently just place them on the front of them, just you know, sitting in a circle, and yeah. I'll put my problems down there. You'd look at everybody's problems, you'd pick your own problems. Really like it. Actually, not so bad to be or, me. Because yeah. everybody is struggling with yeah. something. So one of the things I talk about under the whanau with, the, with one of my eps is the fa, uh, is actually finding people who you can talk to openly, but being really wise about who you're opening up to. So if I'm struggling with motherhood, I don't sit down my kids and tell them, yeah, I don't really like being a mother, you know, that because that would really destabilize Diminished. and it would actually cause them distress and concern. So in that situation, I can be vulnerable and say, hey, I'm feeling a bit wobbly, um, you know, and but these are the things I'm doing to help. And so finding somebody who I can talk to that's not going to be destabilized by that. Being being blood relatives doesn't necessarily mean you're the best person to talk to. Often people are dealing with inherited characteristics. Mm -hmm. um, if you're highly anxious and, you know, there's strong it possibility your mum might be. <laughs> so, yeah, and it could just be um, part of your your family. Genetic makeup. Yeah, absolutely. Inherited. And so think carefully about who you're going to open up your heart to. And, you know, this is why we like therapists. <laughs> therapists. Ah, see what I did there? Therapy. Um, People who are skilled in the art of helping you yeah. to unravel yeah. what's going on. And as an encouragement, most people wait 18 months to two years <laughs> after they recognise they probably need to see somebody, yeah. like a therapist or a therapist, mm. before they do it. So if you're like six or eight or 12 months in, beat the odds. That's it. <laughs> Call someone sooner. Be a winner. Be a winner. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I did. I literally, it was often pain galvanises action. Yes. And I realised I was really responsible for my child and I wasn't quite coping. Yeah. And I wanted to be responsible for my child. Yeah. But I was busy trying to be responsible for everybody else as well. Yeah. So I had to take some action. I had to get yeah. some therapy. Yes. And it was a very good move because I've, I, it's easier to live inside my own mind and body yes. and heart than it used to be. Amazing. I live in myself with more peace yes. and more friendship and more love yes. and acceptance. And the quicker we can do that, then when something does trigger off, when something difficult happens, 
and I had something happen recently that was just you know quite quite a a traumatic experience and so what happens is I'm very quick to respond because I go like oh when this type of thing happens around me and I feel unsafe I need to put in place xyz so that's my jelly buddy concept what's the jelly, someone, tell me the jelly buddy so the jelly buddy is someone that you've agreed with in advance that they're going to be there for you on your wobbly days oh, so you're actually saying look let's talk about this we can't wait till the day because stressed out brains are offline brains and when we're under pressure our ability to problem solve is so deeply impaired that expecting us to find a friend, expecting us to go out and make a, a plan, it, it, it's actually impossible. So how many buddies are you allowed in your jelly buddy? You can have as many as you like but some people will have capacity for a lot of support and other people will have maybe one or two people and I think we all know you might have your your jelly crew your wobbly crew <laughs> and uh, your wobbly wahine that will kind of gather around you but then there might be a couple of people for whom they have that permission to reach in so and have you pre-talked to these people have yes you, do you, yeah that's the whole yeah so you ring them and say I want yeah. you to be my jelly buddy. I give out cards really? that say will you be my jelly <laughs> and you. actually sitting down and going okay you're someone, let's talk, you know, let's, uh, and to be honest, the laughter, the slightly embarrassing, like, let's talk about jelly buddies, is part of the process, because what it does is it puts you slightly off kilter, and in that moment, you'd be like, I need to be really honest, and say that there will be a wobbly day. We all have them. We do. <laughs> Tell me, the last time you yeah. called a jelly buddy, what happened? Probably just in that last little period of time, was talking to a jelly buddy to be able to say something has happened and it's not just the thing it's the response in me is anxiety and I'm feeling quite anxious about what's going on and so just letting actually letting them know what I'm putting in place and so actually understanding that when we talk about it more openly we can talk about it more quickly and when we talk about it more quickly we can do something about it and when we do something about it, we can feel a sense of equilibrium quickly. And I think even just that idea of accepting, we will all have our wobbly days. Absolutely. And I heard somebody saying about triggers, um, like we, we use the word trigger now a lot, mm. right? But like a trigger is literally, when you think about it as a gun, it's pulling, yeah. the, you pull the trigger and a shot is fired. Yes. So, so a trigger, for me, I think of them more as like, um, somebody st stood on a wound yes. and it's and it and the wound is still there so they've activated that wound yeah. so I think you're right that trigger can actually seem completely out of kilter with with mm. what's going on but if you can identify it then mm. you can do something about mm. it wow um, <laughs> there's so much there's so much yeah. here um, one of my favourite songs of yours was Over the Boulder Shoulder Holder. And I did think <laughs> as I got dressed this morning and didn't put a push-up bra on. I haven't given up the fight. No. I've just given up the underwire. Yeah, there you go. And I thought, I'm just going to be able to enjoy your beautiful, <laughs> fulsome figure and boobs. Underwire is overrated. It anyway. is, isn't, isn't, it? It? isn't it great that we're inventing new things? Oh, gosh, oh. yes. Brilliant. I'm just all about the Spanx now. Hey! <laughs> Can I ask you about your menopausal journey because yes. um menopause can hit well perimenopause can hit at any mm. point really from they're saying <laughs> often regularly mid-30s yeah and 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 certainly take women by surprise but I talked to a friend of mine who's I think 52 the other day and she's like mm. no regular periods just the same mm. what's don't know when it's gonna arrive yeah what was your story well I do have I do have a funny story <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you all sorts of things today. Yeah. A uh, funny story. So a couple of years ago, I was probably starting to feel like I was at the beginning of that perimenopause, maybe the odd hot flush, but not, not a whole lot going on. And I had, um, I had a period and then I had another one very quickly after it. And I, that's not normal for me at all. Now, my husband is incredibly supportive and so lovely when I'm unwell in any way, shape or form. He's like the best caregiver ever. So he was like super lovely on the first one and then super lovely on the next one. And we were sort of figuring out why something was, you know, happening that was a bit different in my body. And after the second one, he said to me, oh, so, you know, so was that menopause? <laughs> and I was like, oh, babe. <laughs> Could be up to ten years. Like, oh, oh I'm too right. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> shouldn't have maxed out all the uh, sympathy on that time round. So we figured that out. So that was quite lovely. Earlier this year, I started having like hot flushes to the max. So I'm 51, and 
over summer and sometimes you can't tell because it's summer and I was just having the mad hot flushes and so I went to the doctor because I love going to the doctor and actually got on to some HRT and have been taking I've got the patches on I'm just like slathered in patch underneath here I'm just all one big patch <laughs> <laughs> I just say like just get a patch the size of a sleeping bag and wear it <laughs> so for me I know everyone's different but for mm. me that has absolutely fixed up those symptoms um, and I will be taking that for the, I'm the rest on, of my I think, life. Oh, I think I'm on the lowest <laughs> dose. <laughs> I'm on like the 25 milligram. Apparently, you can take one more. But there was a period of time where they ran out. I it was know. just before Mother's Day. And I, I was heard like, about um, it. I think mm. I did a post. Said, there was a attention. Shortage. There was a shortage in New Zealand. This is not the Mother's Day to forget because mm. there's a shortage on menopause mm. medication. You mm. will be in for the high jump. Um, so I got to the point where I'd get a bigger one and chop it into, you know, oh, yeah. chop the patch into four and that sort of thing. So I am on a low dose. I'm open to it changing, but it's really helped me feel um, just a bit more like my normal self nice. for now. I know I've got a friend yeah. who recently went on menopausal hormone therapy. Um, which I think they call it now, MHT. Yes, I forget that yeah. all the time, but um, because because the understanding is we're not replacing those hormones, mm. we're giving those hormones therapeutic support. So I yeah, like that. Nice. And they got on it after feeling so horrific and they feel mm. like themselves again. They said, I just have some joy back. So I'm so oh. grateful that that is yeah. available to women. It kicked in straight away. Wow. And I feel just, just feels like me. Because even speaking about heartbreak in these mm. middle years, I think it can impact women's intimate relationships really significantly. Absolutely. Yeah, so combining a sense of, uh, you know, who am I and where am I and what's going on in my world, and then I'm also dealing with this whole huge change of how my body's feeling. Yeah, I've got friends who are going through heartbreak challenges at this age, so I was you know, in my early 40s. So pop that into your early 50s and it's just a whole different ball game. So for them actually having some support, their therapeutic support has helped their bodies to feel um, just a bit more like themselves. We're not trying to turn back time. No. We're not trying to turn back the I don't care, T you know, time schmime. This is good, love being this age, but I do want to be able to feel you know, alive and vibrant at this age. So yeah. that certainly helped. Sleeping through the night helps. It's if only the cat would stop waking up. I know. So tell me, um, this is what I ask everybody mm. at the end of the interview, what would your 80-year-old self, so what does 80-year-old Julia, yeah. when she's, I don't know, what's she doing? Is she singing she, a song? What's she up to? She is definitely singing she's probably wildly overdressed i want on my tombstone just to say perpetually overdressed awesome. that's pretty much me um i sort of see myself i don't know if it's 80 but i see myself in those rest home years just maybe still in the pink boots just talking a bit much singing a bit too often wearing clothes that really don't need to be worn you know so outlandishly there and absolutely loving it so good what <laughs> does she my plan. what does your outlandish <laughs> over, perpetually overdressed 80 year old yes. julia say to you today she says keep going keep going you're doing really well you're actually doing really well. you've done a lot you have maximized what's been placed in your hands um but as you get older you are finding yourself more and more don't change i remember a lady years ago i was in a situation where um, I was speaking to a group that had kind of been annexed by another group mm -hmm. and uh, there was a little bit of angst in there and, and this lady came rushing up to me after the event, gave me a big hug and whispered in my ear, stay normal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've stayed normal, I certainly am, uh, normal is probably not the best way to describe me but actually I took that as be yourself. When the pressure's on to gloss it up or pretend everything's fine when it's not, just stay normal and uh, I hope that 80 year old me would be saying stay normal and maybe get less normal <laughs> room for growth uh, and movement there yeah Julia Grace thanks so much such a pleasure